Welcome to Two Dudes, One Movie Podcast. The podcast where two dudes dive into cinematic masterpieces from a different decade each week. From black and white classics to modern day blockbusters, we'll be covering it all. This season, we've been focusing on romantic comedies. And for our fourth episode of the season, we're skadoodling our way into the 80s. It's a film all about meetings and meetings and meetings again. Arguably the greatest rom-com of all time, Rick. It's When Harry Met Sally. Park, I think this is another movie that just asks a bunch of questions. So we gotta dive in here. Please do. Does sex get in the way of male and female friendships? Does our life end at 40? Why is Baldwin such an attractive look in the 80s? Are we having a rom-com theme season or an NYC theme season? Harry Sally is a bonafide classic that just may be the perfect rom-com. Rick, that was a poignant recap right there, really making a deliberate statement. So generally, I told you I think I, I spend between seven and nine minutes on these. Yep. I was behind all day, Park, so I spent maybe two minutes on this. So I apologize that my work might have showed. Rick, that's all right. We are recording this podcast literally minutes after you finished work. It is 8 p.m., it's actually a little after 8 p.m. now, but we hopped on together a little after 8 p.m. right when you finished your day of work, Rick. Park, and we got a cocktail today. Ah, oh, Rick. It's happy hour for you. What do you think it is? There's a little little grapefruit in it. I think it's pink lemonade mimosas. Is not that sounds this is not disgusting. That's not a night drink, Park. <laughs> I don't I don't actually know what it is. It's either called like midnight and Paris or day afternoon in Rome some something that sounds like a Woody Allen movie is what it is named. Rick, you should have had it last week I guess I should have I probably drank this before last week if I have this at least I do have this cocktail weekly love to dive into your weekly cocktail list if you guys want to know the recipe it's a nice Aperol cocktail great for summer even though I, this might even come out in the fall or winter so I don't know if it'll be great this will most likely be out in the fall or winter <laughs> so I'm just, just kidding this, this is a fall themed cocktail is that it actually is <laughs> I will say, though, I feel like I dressed, for, I dressed for fall in Winter Park. We got a sweater tonight. Rick, you are representing what is the rom-com look right there. It's the I'm almost 40 rom-com look. Yeah. It's a very specific brand. I'm just not balding. Well, you were pointing this out to me is that there were a lot of sweaters in this movie specifically. Well, Billy Crystal wears the iconic sweater in this movie. But then I also think that literally... For whatever reason, like in New York, if you're not dressing up, are you just wearing a sweater? It's a good point, Rick. It's either suit or sweaters. It's a suit and sweater kind of city. Quick question for you: What is your favorite sweater in film all time? I feel like I, I feel like I know this. That's so tough. I'm, I feel like I'm gonna be missing something super obvious. So the one, like the one in my head that I immediately came to my head, I do not know if it's my favorite is the Chris Evans sweater. <laughs> that's the one I was thinking of. Okay, it's a great sweater. When that movie came out, that's all you could talk about was the well, Knives also, Out Chris Evans sweater. it's not fair, Park, because Chris Evans wears that sweater. It looks like the most amazing thing in the world. If I wear that sweater, it is, I just look like melted vanilla ice cream. <laughs> so, <laughs> Rick, so, yeah, melted vanilla ice cream popular. is a look nowadays. I guess so. I guess it might be considered a milkshake. Yeah, Rick, that's actually, I think that's a compliment. The milkshake. You just I went from an insult to a compliment in the matter of seconds. But like, are we as men, can we be milkshakes, Park? Or are we just melted ice cream? It's 2023. We can be whatever type of cream we want. This is true. We can be whatever type of, of creams drink that we want to be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is getting a little off the rails. So why don't we move on back uh, on topic, Rick? So we're going to jump right on in to the good, the bad and the ugly. Park, I feel like, as always, the more prepared one, you stay more here, but I think I'm gonna go first. I'm gonna take it from you. Rick, please do. Okay. I love when you jump into it. So my good is I'll have what she's having, Park. <laughs> one I think, and like I would actually have to look at a list of quotes. No matter what, I don't think anyone can disagree. And if you do disagree, I guess you're wrong. This is a top 50 quote in movies. Like, I'll have what she's having to me is a top 50 quote in movies. Yeah. Just the whole scene and then, like, the lead up to the quote as well. Like, not just the words, you know? 
obviously that scene has some some funny moments without that but once that line happens at the end it, it just feels like that entire scene was building up to that joke in that moment in the best way possible also learns that princess i think like princess diana went to go see this movie and it was like a big deal since it's like a rated r rom-com so people were like shocked that she would go see a a rated r rom-com but i think she was like interviewed about this scene in particular and she like deflected to something else interesting very interesting right and and in reality i love a good uh what sandwich was she having we were just i was just talking about it uh something with a p provolone or was she, pastr- she was having a Reuben, so pastrami. Or I think she was having a Reuben. Sure. Was it pastrami? It was something. I'm not a New Yorker, Park. We just grew up where New Yorkers retire. It's true. Anyways, it looked delicious. She obviously enjoyed it, so I'll have what she's having. Also, I think the best way I can encapsulate this movie is a Reddit quote that I found three seconds ago. That someone said, it's basically a Woody Allen movie without the ick of Woody Allen. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fair assessment <laughs> and honestly like i feel like i feel like it's fair because uh, woody allen movies dialogue is always yeah like like d- narratively and dialogue is very very strong but i so. mean you could see the inspiration of the intercuts of the documentary interview style from oh, annie yeah. hall i mean that's, that's true that i think they did it better than annie hall did it uh but the inspiration is clearly there from annie hall Almost all the jokes in this movie land still. Yes. This we're movie, like, Andy Hall was tough for me, joke This wise. movie stands the test of time, where a lot of the other films that we've watched this season so far in ways do not. I think Annie Hall stands the test of time in a lot of ways, but Breakfast at Tiffany's does not, in my opinion. Well, anyways, Park, this, that's my piece. That's all I got. What do you got? Rick, I got a few. And it's going to sound kind of similar to last week's good, but I'm going to start off again with the writing. The writing is a very, very good. The reality of the situation is that if you want to create a successful rom-com, your writing has to be strong. This movie is a culmination of witty dialogue, strong themes, and an evocation of pathos. It really delivers on all the marks, incredible script, incredible themes, love everything about the writing. Another good Rick is the characters. I love Harry and Sally. To this point, there aren't two characters I love more in our season than Harry and Sally. And I won't be surprised, Rick, if that hasn't changed by the end of the season. Obviously, very different genre. How about last season? Maybe, yeah, I think probably last season. They are just- They're strong. They're yeah. such likable characters, and Rick, the reason that they're stro- so strong is because characterization is always in the details, and these two are filled with little ticks and details that create a level of realism that few movies are able to achieve. The rambling and the specificness of Sally's orders in the diner and Harry's cynicism just with the little things like reading the end of books just in case he dies before he can finish it. These things, that make them them. So, love these characters. They're written so well, so nuanced, so filled with detail. Another one of my goods, the theme of friendship throughout this story. Uh, a lot of people might think of this as a movie about how friendship leads to love. But I think the reality is this is a movie about how friendship is a necessary component to finding love. You need a bedrock of friendship in a romantic partner to have a thriving, romantic, loving relationship. And I think that theme shines through in this movie. It makes me wonder, because this one set the stage of a lot of rom-coms yeah. to a T, right? Mm-hmm. It makes me wonder how many rom-coms do have the like main character or both of the main characters are like best friends and like they don't want to be in a relationship and then they get to a relationship. I feel like there's a lot of movies, especially the ones that we watch, it's like romantic interest from like the very first second. Yeah. We used to obviously see it done wrong. I don't know if you watched the worst rom-com I may have watched in my entire life 
is that new Ashton Kutcher and Drew Barrymore rom-com on Netflix? Uh, you mean Reese Witherspoon? Reese Witherspoon? I'm so sorry. So yeah. sorry, Drew and Where, Reese. That was terrible because they're in separate places the entire time and their only interaction is over phone calls and you don't buy into their relationship at all. But it's the same, but I feel like whoever wrote, and I'm going to I'm gonna absolutely destroy whoever like wrote it because whoever wrote it to me it looks. It feels like they they watched You've Got Mail, Sleepless in Seattle, and this movie, and was like, "Oh, let's make a movie and just combine them all together and see if it works." And like the, the writing and the jokes are like insanely lazy. Honestly, ChatGPT probably wrote it. Yeah, I I definitely felt like with that movie that they didn't execute that storyline well at all, whereas. A movie like Sleepless in Seattle, you know, they're not in the same space. They haven't met each other throughout the entirety of the film, but it works. Well, because they, they actually cared about the characters, though. I think that's the biggest thing we... Like, whenever we do pick apart movies and, like, pick apart the, like, bad parts about movies, it it's generally comes to that it's obvious they don't care about the character. They just care about the story. Rick, which what is... do I say every season? Characters are the most important parts of making a great film. It's what propels the story forward. Not a nature documentary, though, Park. Rick, you got me there. Rick, I got one more good, and that good is the ending of the film. Normally, I'll say I love the beginnings of films, and that is true with this film, but the ending is absolutely incredible. It's the ending that every rom-com aspires to nowadays i feel like i think the beginning is why i think every film should aspire like to be a beginning like not even rom-coms all films i like it when when movies kind of tell you what the movie is a little bit in the beginning or just like what you're what you're kind of about to be in for so to speak yeah and like i feel like you they really hit you with it here like the whole car ride and like the snarky jokes and obviously it's a, this is like a very popular rated r rom-com and I mean, we're in the 80s. I bet, like, certain things that Harry just talks about out of nowhere, people are probably, like, a little taken aback. I don't know. 80s were pretty edgy. I think the conversations were a little more in the limelight at that point. Rick, I'm not that old, unfortunately, so I can't tell you from first-hand accounts what, what society was like. Let's move on to bads. What are your bads from this film? At first, there were nothing, because there really is not. We're going to see what the ROM and comms scale really says here, Park, because... Says? Says, says. <laughs> Park, it's been a long day. It has been. Also, this is my second one. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if you're able to make coherent <laughs> sentences by the end of this podcast. Anyways, nothing bad about this movie. Uh, but then I thought about it, Park. I was thinking about New York City. Yeah. And this movie really makes you think that New York City is like the greatest place to live on Earth. One, this movie gives me the impression that New York City does not have that many people. Because every other scene, there's like, I feel like they're not actually in New York. So maybe they are. I don't know. But either way, this gives me the false impression that New York City is a beautiful, wonderful place to live. I don't buy it. You're uh, taking shots at all of our New York City listeners. I know, but they all have their little stories of like how I'm assuming they could like understand that New York City is not the greatest place to live. I don't know what the greatest place to live is. Everywhere sucks. Just like you, Rick, I also wrote none. This movie is the bar for rom-coms. It's perfected the formula and everything has been an imitation game since, in my opinion. Park, it's time to get down and dirty to the uglies. What do you got? Rick, one thing, aggressive PDA. And I'll say it was funny how it was written. The movie starts off with 10 years prior to the main story and then five years prior to the main story. And both of those quote-unquote flashback sequences start off with the other person kissing their significant other. So Harry kissing his girlfriend from college or high school or whatever age they're supposed to be but don't look like they're that age at all. And then when Sally is kissing her uh, boyfriend in the airport. So, um, Was that just the 80s though, Park? People just kissing everywhere? That may be. Again, wasn't there to, to know firsthand, but... Uh, it's just kind of like, if I was walking past that in an airport, I'd be like, get a room, you know, Rick? Would you? Would you be the get a room, the call? No, I wouldn't. I'd just walk around. 
But I, I'll tell you what, I'd be pretty frustrated if I was on one of those escalator walking platforms oh, and they were like blocking my way because they were making out. Swap and spit. <laughs> tonsil hockey? Tonsil hockey, Rick. No, but that would that would that would grind my gears, Rick. So aggressive PDA is my ugly from this film. Part of mine is and there's a little asterisk here. Because I understand it's for development of the character, and this needs to be here. So this is not like I don't want this in the movie. It should be in the movie. But ordering food. I like... There's not... And I can't say there's not many movies. There's definitely movies that I have, like, moments that I just kind of cringe. The first time Sally orders food is a lot worse than, like, the other times in the movie she does. At least in my opinion. Like, the other times in the movie, she's just generally asking sauces and dressings on the side. They really amp it up in the very first time she orders food, and it's like a million different things that she that she was very particular about. And like, obviously, they put that there because then they have the high maintenance conversation later in the film. So like, there's a reason why it's there. But I just like feel like I cringed. I just could not imagine one. I could not imagine me being anywhere, and and like doing that, like ordering food like that. I I I, I would like just feel embarrassed. I'd feel sorry for the for the person taking the order. Those people are the folks that customer service folks despise. Yep. Absolutely. That make them wake up and hate the world every day. So don't be a Sally when you order, Rick. At least a first order Sally. I feel like she gets... <laughs> yeah. <slow. laughs> gets a little better as, as the years go on. Like just sauces on the side to me. Sauces on the side. You don't want tomato. You don't want pickles. The typical things. That's normal. That's fine. Like to say, take it off, leave, put it on the side, easy. Honestly, her first order felt like a intense fall Starbucks order. That is true, it did. What, what probably makes Starbucks workers not want to live anymore. It's probably yeah. that. Hey, if you're a Starbucks worker and listening to our podcast, let us know. Do you enjoy your job or do you rue the existence of life? Also, tell us your worst order and I'll yes, read it out. Yes, we we'd you. love to hear your worst order. Actually, tell us your worst order, and I will film a TikTok and go get it. <laughs> Please. That's so dangerous. This is a lot of people's first rated R movie, uh, because, I mean, it's just like, it's a rom-com. Do you have a first rated R movie? I'm sure I do, but I couldn't tell you what it is at all. I don't have that story where I went to the theater and bought a ticket for a rated R movie. I was over at someone's house, and we watched Air Force One, the... I think it's Harrison Air Force, the Ford. Harrison Ford movie. Nice. <laughs> that, was my, that was my first rated R movie. That's a good one to, to lose your rated R virginity to. And the thinking of was, was my friend told me, he was like, oh, in today's world, this is PG-13, but they didn't have it back then, so it's okay. <laughs> so that's how, and I think I told my dad, and my dad was mad at me, because I was like, what, like sixth grade, fifth grade when this happened? <laughs> that's, that's so funny. I love it. We've reached that point in the podcast where we talk about the differences and similarities to the genre from then to now. It's our then and now segment. I was talking about how this movie perfected the rom-com formula. And because of that, you see films from every decade in this film. So I thought instead of talking about all films of the genre and how they are like Harry Met Sally, I just thought it would be a great idea to go through a romantic comedy beat sheet. And for those at home who don't know what a beat sheet is, a beat sheet is basically a list of story beats or moments in a story that propel the story forward. These can include the inciting incident, emotional turns, reactions, etc, etc. So this beat sheet that I found comes from the website Dobble, so shout out to them. And I'm just going to go through the beat sheets and we're going to talk about how, very quickly, where Harry Met Sally fits into that and how it fits into it perfectly, Rick. How's that sound? Rick, let's do it. I want to, I want to see how it fits in there. Rick, beat number one, beat number two, pretty simple. Beat number one, introducing hero one. Beat number two, introducing hero two. They both show up almost at the same time. We first meet Harry kissing his girlfriend in the opening shot of the movie. And in that same opening shot, Sally pulls up behind the two making out. So there we go. Check it off. 
the next beat they call meet cute which to them is basically the moment that your love interest meets often in an awkward or humorous circumstance obviously they first meet in the middle of a makeout session but i i i think the movie nails it twice because they don't just meet in one makeout session rick they meet again in another makeout session so they, they meet various times in the movie they have a lot they have a lot of different meets i'll say the weakest meet is probably the third one where they just run into each other at a bookstore Parker, i love a good meet cute though it is it was it was a good meet cute uh the next beat is the no way beat for a romance arc to really hit there has to be a very good reason these two people cannot be together at least in their minds the first time that they meet they both have reasons to believe that the two of them would never work together sally thinks harry's a jerk and harry is marrying another woman the the second time that they meet so both of them have very strong beliefs and foundations of why it won't work out it's true. the nerd in the jock park can never be That's right uh the next beat is the turning point 10 years since their first meeting the two are both out of long-term relationships and by luck run into each other beginning their platonic friendship this is the turning point when their friendship begins the first two times they met they weren't even able to be friends and then the third time because of their relational issues they lean on each other in a newly blossoming friendship rick then we move to the midpoint or the raising the stakes beat and this is when harry and sally finally sleep with each other after the emotional insecurities brought out of both Harry and Sally with their exes. So obviously, sleeping together, that's raising the stakes quite a bit, Rick. That, I would say, that raises the stakes almost all the way, Park. All the way. Next, we have the really no way beat, which is the two grow awkward because of what happened with them sleeping together, and it results in an argument at their best friend's wedding. Nails that as well. Then you have the crisis, the New Year's party when Harry walks out on Sally. All seems lost there, Rick. Seems over. But Rick, our final beat, the happy ending. Harry comes to his senses, realizes he loves Sally, runs back to her, and the two live happily ever after. Until 40. Sally doesn't really... She, I feel like she thinks her life ends at 40. That's fair. So, at but, least until 40, they lived happily. That's true, Rick. But we don't get to see past 40 in this film, so... Yeah. Every now and then there's whispers that Billy Crystal wants a sequel. That would be something at this the, that would be. at this point. <laughs> hey, that could honestly be like a genre-defining type of sequel. I just feel like it should just be them doing the interview, though. Like that all the old couples do. It should just be them. Yeah. We should get an interview. Just, <laughs> I don't know. Just interview. <laughs> but Rick, uh, I thought that that was a little different than what we've normally done in the Minute Now segment. But it just shows you how this movie perfectly fits into a rom-com beat sheet and hits all of the cues that you could come to expect out of stories like these. Okay, did, I realize when we talked about The Best Friend's Wedding, we have not talked about arguably one of the best supporting couples yes. that any rom-com might have ever, I would think. Yeah, it's so true. Obviously, Carrie Fisher's best role, right? No. But, <laughs> I mean, it's a really great role, though. You, you joke, but it is, it's, it's a, great it's a role. really great role. And this is coming off the back of the Star Wars trilogy. Yeah, she arguably stretches herself more as an actress in this than that. Most of the times, those friendship couples in, in rom-coms are there to show what the protagonist couple are missing or lacking or their successes and failures, yada, 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 and... This couple does it so well. They both are cared for. Like, just as you say that everything's about the characters, they're both actually cared for, too. They are. Which, like, the bad, like, the bad side characters are just to be almost, like, a semi-reflection, almost, to, like, make the main characters think about things differently or look better. And, like, they do that, but they, act, they are themselves, though. I, I will say Marie, I feel like, is given more love than Jess, which is Harry's best friend. He had to throw out his table, Park, his wheel table. Yeah, but they still both have a have strong characterization for supporting roles. 
In my opinion, Bark, if you are in a movie and you have a character with a mustache, that's the only characterization he needs. It's true. He doesn't need that much dialogue. So, uh, Rick, I heard you had some questions for us this week. I have questions all the time. That's actually my thought patterns. Some people have internal dialogue. Mine is just questions. Rick, I would love to hear some of your questions. So here we go. Park, can guys and girls just be friends? That is the central question of the movie right there. I am going to say yes. It's wild, Park. Because I have had friends that are girls, and it never turned into anything else. I agree. I think that, yes, guys and girls, they can be just friends. It's okay. But, Park, if you're just friends for a while, it grows, it blossoms. My wife is scoffing at me in the background, Rick. She's scoffing at my response. Are you scoffing? She does not believe. Yeah, because you're the one that always being like, oh, that girl used to say hi to me. She totally had a thing for me. I mean, that's true. Women had things for me all the time, Rick. Because one, look at me. Two, if you can't look at me, hear my voice. And Rick, it's just reality. Women are into me. Park, I saw you not that long ago. And I remember one of the nights we were all hanging out, because, you know, we are uh, great married friends of each other. I remember you went through, and I feel like you had 60 different girls from college. That you were like, yeah, they were into me. I could have had them. It's Some true. of these, I feel like you just walked past someone in the grocery store. And that was, that was that. Rick, I just, I like to think that my superpower is knowing when people are into me. And so all I have to do is walk past someone in the grocery store to know. I just feel like you're having a meet cute every single day. It's, it's true, Rick. <laughs> I got to admit, I, exude, I do exude some confidence. I'm not going to lie. A little bit. As much confidence as a little string bean man like myself can exude. <laughs> I guess that's fair, Park. Rick, I got a question for you. Give it to me. Would you have what she's having? Park, this is one of the greatest questions ever asked in Hollywood. In this scenario, this situation, I would love to have what she's having. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Park? <laughs> Rick, I don't even think it's a real question. Of course. Who I would think it... you're not human if you don't. But I will say, I might ask for what she's having minus some of the toppings. Oh, just get some. Yeah, Park, we said that was appropriate earlier. You can ask for a few things on the side. Yeah, I would probably get any type of lettuce on the side, tomatoes. I'm a pretty meat and cheese type of sandwich gentleman i know i think your your hamburger orders are absolutely wild to me i don't know i can get i can order a good hamburger like i'll get a hamburger with like bacon and an egg on it and cheese that's a good burger are those your ideal toppings i guess not even hamburgers what is your ideal sandwich toppings sandwich toppings i don't know but burger toppings okay burger toppings over easy egg with two pieces of bacon, not too crispy. They gotta have a little chew to them, Rick, but crispy, you know what I mean? And then two burgers, two patties, with cheese on top of each patty. Melted yellow American cheese, Rick. American cheese is the best burger cheese. I'll that is there. my perfect burger with all of its toppings right there. Parker, I'm not an egg on the burger guy. I love a good runny egg, Rick. I, just, I, don't, I don't like the hype of an egg on my burger. I think I have a special place in my heart for like runny eggs. My dad used to make this breakfast in the mornings called Egg in the Basket. And I think it's got some other different names that people use. But the idea is that you have a piece of bread and you cut out a hole in the middle of it and you crack an egg, then put the egg yolk into that hole and then you put it on the stove and kind of let it all come together and... Then you got an egg in the basket of your bread, Rick. I'm actually really curious. This is another question for our audience. What do you call that? I feel like that was, isn't that like egg toast? I feel like I just call it like egg toast. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> got a lot of names. Well, yours, is more, yours is more whimsical, so. <laughs> it is. Well, I'm a whimsical guy, Rick, so. You're not a veggie guy, Park. I'm, well, that's not true. I'm not a fruit guy. I'll do a good amount of veggies, Rick. Okay, okay. How about pickles? Are you a pickle guy? I'm not a pickle guy, Rick. Oh. That is something I'm not. Does your wife like pickles at least? She loves them. I take them off my okay. sandwich and give them to her every time. That's how you know you're in an ideal marriage. 
one of the parties can give gives the pickles to the other party. That was the first thing that was asked in our marriage counseling before we got married is, does one of you like pickles and the other one not? And we told them our answer and they said, perfect, you're ready. That's all you need. My wife absolutely loves pickles. It's like one of her top foods. I'm like indifferent. Like if a pickle falls out of my sandwich, I'm not picking it back up. But if it's in my sandwich, I'll eat it, you know? Fair enough. Anyways, Park, we got one more question. I think this is the greatest question in my mind for this for this podcast. Now, I love when they go into sharper image, <laughs> mainly because it, it dates the movie. And I love when movies like have something. It's a time capsule of its era. Yeah. I just think with the things that are in that sharper image is just like hysterical to me. How big that karaoke player was that they were singing on. Rick, it was a big one. And the hat, whatever that hat was they were wearing was funny too. I know Sharper Image as the place that you go into the mall, you can sit down in a massage chair, you can play with like whatever new crappy robotic toy. It's just a fun, it's a fun store. Is Sharper Image the greatest mall store of all time? It might be. I think the, we didn't have a Sharper Image where I grew up. It was called like Brookstone or something like that. Oh, that's always confusing. They're the same. There was no store that could compete with that. Maybe a GameStop when I was a younger kid because they used to have like the demos out that you could play in the store. I feel like I'd group, I'll group like Brookstone, Sharper Image. There's like another one and it was like, it was that same type of store. My sisters would go shopping. I'd get pulled in the, into the mall with them and like I'm going to that store and sitting in a massage chair and that's my afternoon. Is like Brookstone and Sharper Image still stores today i don't know rick i don't think they are i just remember when like borders the bookstore went out of business i feel like those are all just, like i just feel like they really went out of business too it's a time capsule of its era rick we're gonna transition to our activity of the day it's our fun activity rick we're doing something a little different i feel like i shouldn't be the one introducing it but i am so suck it because this was not my idea <laughs> <laughs> this was my idea <laughs> this was your idea and i <laughs> this was completely your idea it's our fun activity. I know I will, I'll give it back. You can explain it. This movie, When Harry Met Sally, is all about this couple meeting and falling in love and interspliced throughout the movie are documentary interviews of old couples and how they met. And so I got the brilliant idea, Rick. What if we sat down in our little, our little couch, as one might say, let's see. Rick, if I just sat down in, in my little couch right here. Hold on, Park. I'm going to join you on the couch. There we go. Yeah. We're sitting on our couch now, Rick. Should I lay back? Lay back on the couch, Rick. Get comfortable. This is your couch. It's, I mean, it's true. This is my couch. It's just... I'm like a, I feel like I'm a sloucher. So, Rick, we are going to share our love stories. We are going to share with the audience how we met our wives. We're both married. We both have some interesting stories to share, so I thought that this would be a really great, fun activity on brand with the movie and something a little different than what uh, the audience has come to expect from us each week. Park, my love story is a ballad that would make Jimmy Buffett happy. So here we go, Park. Set the scene. I worked at a, it's like a family re reunification type thing. We lived on the property. Picture a property that was like the greatest retirement housing village you've ever seen. That was where I lived. Right, there was beautiful lakes that they didn't want us to swim in, but they were beautiful. I worked there for two years. My wife joined on as my same position, but on the girl side. So she joined on after I was there for two years, I think, right? Oh no, she joined on after one year. I was a few months out of a different relationship. I don't, I don't know if you met. No, but I still follow her on Instagram. We still like each other's posts. Oh, she's probably, I wonder if she's a listener. She probably is. Hey, Rick's X. Thanks for listening to Two Dudes, One Movie Podcast. The podcast. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Anyways, out of that. And then, you know, we had more staff came on. This pretty girl came on Staff Park. And I remember that there were several attempts that I tried to have a conversation with her. And I could not figure out how to, like, have a conversation. I remember there was one... My friend Ben got a van stuck on the side of the lake. And the, like, literally, I remember watching this from afar. The van is slowly drifting into the lake as he's trying to like pull out of this like ditch thing. I think this is a great moment. So I was like, oh, she got hot Cheetos at the snack bar. We could have a whole conversation about hot Cheetos. 
Park, turns out with almost strangers, you can't have that big of a conversation about hot cheaters. Um, so that lasted about two seconds. Yeah, Rick, can you reenact that conversation real quick? I really think it was me going up to her, and I also got hot Cheetos. And I think I literally just asked if she liked hot Cheetos. And I think she just said yes, and that was it. <laughs> so hot Cheetos was not an icebreaker. <laughs> not an icebreaker. That's stage one, Park. Stage two is lifeguard lessons, Park. Lifeguard lessons? We had, we had to be lifeguards at this job. I know. You can't look at me now and say, hey, he looks like a lifeguard. Maybe I'm not. I don't think I'm certified anymore. But I remember I saw, like, stickers on her water bottles about different bands, specifically the 1975. So I thought I, like, was going to tell a little story to, like, a group of people or a joke. It might have been a joke. It was something. And then I, like, make a joke or a reference, and she just walks away. And, like, I don't think she actually heard it at all. But again, Park, again, we had another miss. Now the final miss, Park, the miss that, that sets up the rest, is we had a little campfire night. Okay, well, we do yeah. campfires from now. We, we chat. The girls the girls and the guys intermix a little bit. The, the program assistants, not, not, the, not the kids. That's not allowed, Park. Not allowed. You chat with the opposite, the opposite gender. It's a little scary, but that's why you got the buffer of the campfire. That's what campfires are made. They're made for to be buffers, and they're made for s'mores, and then I guess warmth, but that's probably like the third or fourth thing they're meant for. That's fair. I was sitting probably directly across the campfire. I made three attempts to ask something to her, and she did not hear a single one. Or she says she doesn't hear Park, but it kind of seemed like she was ignoring, but I don't know. But she, anyway, she probably didn't hear it all. Mainly because there was K-pop music blasting. So I don't think anyone heard me when I was trying to, like, talk. I'm not a big talker, so that's probably why, too. I mumble a lot. I probably mumble on this podcast a lot. I could just be speaking, like, a different language in this podcast half the time. I'm probably just mumbling. That's all right, Rick. We love your mumbles. Now comes the Jimmy Buffett night. Jimmy the moment Buffett that night. Jimmy Buffett would be proud of. We had a margarita night park, and I can make, I can make a damn good margarita. Rick, so confident. I, can't, I think I can make one of the best margaritas, and I stand behind that. All, all by eye, Park. I'm not... No measuring. No measuring. I don't care about your cocktail skills if you measure. Hey, podcast listeners out there, if you want one of Rick's world-famous margaritas, send in $150 to our podcast, and he will personally ship out a handmade margarita just for you. Sounds like a really tough way to ship it out, but yeah, I will. If you, if you send in $150, bucks, why not? There we go. So, Park, I was confident in my ability... We went to get the supplies. I think on these nights that we all went out to make margaritas, all of the guys in general spent like $150 to $200 worth of ingredients to, to so everyone would just drink, drink. Park, park. We were at the pool, a little night swim, a little Rita's. It was a fantastic night. Now, Park, when you get a couple margaritas in, all stories tend to escalate, and Park, that's where mine escalates slightly. There you go. So, Park, I don't know about you, but when I drink... I have to pee so bad, often as well. So my now wife and I, I call her Spa. Spa and I, we were chatting. We started, you know, we were all in a group. We're all in a group here. And then let's say this is, we were the orange, we're in the group, and then we, we split off to a different side of the pool. There we go. You know, so we started to split off, Park. We chat, we chat, margarita's empty, they need refill. Margarita's empty, they need refill. We're just chatting. And during this time chatting, we spent two and a half hours chatting, Park. In those two and a half hours, I think I peed 12 times. And mind you, this is a pool. So, like, I'm near the edge. I have to get out every single time, do a little quick walk to the edge where someone can't see me, just pee in the woods, jump back in. Five minutes later, for whatever reason, I have to pee again. Don't understand. Maybe something was going on. Rick, you ripped the seal. That's what happened. Then we rejoined the group. And Ben was, I think he was telling some story. And while the story was happening, she held my hand underwater. Ooh. Mind you, Park, days before this, I tried to have a hot Cheeto conversation with her. It didn't work. And now we're, she's holding my hand. Absolutely crazy. And one of my friends, they were like, oh, I think they noticed. And they were like, ooh, it's time to round up. We got to go. It's getting too serious. So then we, we drove back home. All of us. Uh, we didn't drive back home. We walked back home because quite a few Rita's deep. Smart. That's responsible, Rick. Yes. 
and our home was like two seconds away. And then Spo was, she was flying to Houston the next day. So I went, I went to go do hot yoga, as you might imagine a, a man of my caliber does on the regular. It's the only time my life ever did hot yoga was that morning. The whole time I was just talking to them. I was like, do I text her? Do I not text her? We just held hands. Is this a big deal? I held hands with a coworker. What's happening? Then we discuss that we're going to talk about it when she gets back. Week goes by. We have a little, we do a few laps around the property. And then she got COVID. And then I kept bringing her Frappuccinos as she had COVID. Starbucks, shout out again. And park those Frappuccinos and those margaritas and COVID. God bless. I'm married now. Wow. What a story, Rick. Bottom line is margaritas, frappuccinos, and COVID can get you any woman. They can, they can get you, or man, Park. They get you anyone. Trifecta right there. The trifecta, the great equalizer, someone someone might say. I guess that means it's, it's my turn. Yeah, Park, and for this, our producer is coming on the pod for, I think, the first time. Rick, this is making her podcast debut is none other than producer Becky, my wife. Woo! <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. To the Two Dudes, One Movie podcast. All right. So, our love story. Do you want to go or should I go? Why don't you take it away? Well, actually, maybe I should because you don't remember the story. <laughs> so, Parker and I were in college. We're both in the same student organization, and Parker was on the greeting committee, was already established, very outgoing. I was with my roommate, and he comes over to us, introduces himself, asks me, what's your name? What's your major? We were both in the journalism school at that time, so he was like, oh my gosh, J school, awesome. That was kind of the end of the conversation, and we went our separate ways. Now, a few weeks later, I come back. He's greeting at this meeting again. He comes up to me and my friend, and we have the exact same conversation. And I'm not the person to be like, hey, we've already done this before, but <laughs> exact same thing of what's your name? What's your major? Oh, wow, we're both in the J school. <laughs> uh, mind, mind you, that as a greeter, I have my spiel, the things that I hit. Yeah, what's your name? What's your major? Those are cornerstones questions to ask when you're in college and when you're meeting a bunch of people. And so I can't help that that was my spiel. But don't you think after answering a few questions, you'd remember that we've had this word-for-word -word conversation? Uh, you know, you know how they say you never forget the love of your life when you first meet them that is an incorrect <laughs> statement yeah so anywho why don't you take it from there so that was our first meeting jump forward probably what like a year or so after that yeah. um becky starts to become friends with rick over here and a couple other of our roommates in college they went on some trips together did some good things and uh, she started coming around. I started remembering this girl that I had two conversations with. Well, in your mind, only one conversation. That's fair. <laughs> only one conversation. And uh, I decide I'm, you know, I'm interested in her. I want to get to know her more. So I was coming back from summer vacation. I had made up in my mind, like, I like this girl. I'm going to ask her out. I want to, like, get to know her. And so I start talking to her a bunch. And the first time... I see her, we're going to Steak and Shake, and I'm like, hey, a bunch of us are going to Steak and Shake, do you want to join? And you said... I said, no, I have to be up really early for work tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she didn't care. Shot to the heart. <laughs> Shot to the heart, Rick. Um, so that goes along for a good few months, and we're getting to, we're getting to Halloween, Rick, and I made the goal that I am going to ask this girl out by Halloween. Well, every day before Halloween came and went, and it was Halloween itself. We were at a Halloween party, and she showed up. She, I guess, got a ride with her roommate or something like that, so it was the end of the night, and her roommate was leaving, but we were about to start a, a movie. 
you were interested. Don't, for, don't forget the movie. It's a live action Scooby Doo. It was the live action Scooby Doo, and she wanted to stay and watch it. And so, I was like, "Oh, hey, like if you want to stay, like I can drive you home afterwards when you want to go." And in my mind, I'm like, "Great, I'll drive her home, and then I can ask her out." But at this point, I knew Parker was interested. I was not. And so I was like trying to be polite. I was like, oh no, like it's so out of your way. And he goes, <laughs> he says, oh no, it's no problem. I love driving. <laughs> and so I said, no, it's okay. I'll leave with my roommate. <laughs> Uh, so another shot to the to the heart right there. But it worked out because had I driven her home that night, I would have asked her out and she would have said no. And yeah. we wouldn't be here. She wouldn't be the producer of this podcast. No. You'd have to do it yourself and that would be a train wreck. Yes, it's true. That would be a mess. So after Halloween, her birthday is just a, a couple weeks after that. I don't know how it happened, but I ended up planning your birthday party. Probably because I just inserted my will into the situation and said... <laughs> Here I am, hear me roar. And so That's a Parker move. It's on brand. I just decided to it was her twenty first birthday and I decided to throw the party, get people to come over to our apartment, and then we'd go out and get some drinks. I bought you your first legal drink. My parents did on my actual birthday, but whatever. I I bought you this is my story, honey. This is my perspective. It's our story. (laughs) This is my story. Um Anyways, I bought you a Jaeger bomb. <laughs> your first drink. Beautiful. And I think that's really what pushed her over the edge to fall in love with me. Somehow that won me over. Maybe it was the drinking. I don't know. Push comes to shove, Rick. A few weeks later, it's Friendsgiving. We're having a huge Friendsgiving party at our apartment. This is a small apartment probably with 80 people packed into it, it felt like. <laughs> I All left right. it halfway through. Because <laughs> there are too many people. Well, Rick, by the end of that night, we had a beanbag chair that all of us chipped in for besides me. <laughs> and I was sitting on that beanbag chair. <laughs> and she was sitting next to me on the beanbag chair. And you know, in a beanbag chair, you, you kind of slouch into the middle. So we were leaning up on each other. I came back into the apartment at that moment. Yeah, and my buddy Zach was right there. He was watching. And after the fact, he's like, Mark, Becky must like you. you were, she was sitting on the beanbag chair with you. <laughs> I, no, I think the real evidence was that I sat through watching all of Ice Cream on the Balcony that night. That's true. That's true. For those of you who don't know what Ice Cream on the Balcony is, Ice just Cream on the Balcony, just go look it up on YouTube. Ice Cream on the Balcony, there's four episodes. You can find it on YouTube. Wholesome family entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> It's it, Ice Cream on the Balcony walked so that Two Dudes, One Movie podcast could run. That's how I look at it. Sure. I would say Full House walked so that Ice Cream on the Balcony could take a single step. I, was, I thought you were going to say Full House walked so that Ice Cream on the Balcony could exist. <laughs> Yeah, basically. Ice Cream on the Balcony did not run. It just it was there. <laughs> just stood. Anyways, the combination of beanbag chairs, ice cream on the balcony, Jaeger bombs is what <laughs> resulted, and forgotten conversations is what has resulted in our love story. Yeah. And that's... that's the rest was history. The rest was history. I think that's my cue. All right. Well, now this is the point where we kick the producer back off screen into her dungeon. Bye, producer. Go out of this. Park, we both had some lovely stories. Before we get to the ramen comps, yeah, I need to make a slight correction. Rick, please do. I did not buy Frappuccinos. I bought iced caramel macchiatos. That's an important distinction. It's an important distinction. I will say, I'm pretty sure that right when, right when she got COVID, I asked her what was she want from Starbucks. She said that just off the top of her head. And I think I delivered eight to nine ice caramel macchiatos just out of nowhere. Because this was beginning COVID. So this was like isolation for four weeks. I at least delivered two macchiatos uh, per week. Ice caramel macchiato, not frappuccino. My apologies. That would have been such a travesty if someone went out there and got a girl COVID and tried to get frappuccinos to win her heart over. 
Well, first of all, it'd be really bad if they got a girl COVID. <laughs> hey, that's the strat. That's the strat, according to you. <laughs> I guess so. I guess that's the that's the that's how you repeat the strategy. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> the ROM and the comm scale. I've been waiting for this moment because I am waiting for this moment to see if it's not going to be a 10 out of 10. I'm so curious. So Park, before I go, I feel like I need you to go first. All right, I'm just going to do it. My ROM for this movie is a five. And Rick, my comm for this movie is a five. Park, it's a perfect 10. A perfect 10 from the rom-com scale. Also, I just realized we're still sitting on the couch. Our love stories have ended, Rick, so I'm going to get off this couch, Rick. Should I get off the couch? Rick, it's your couch. Do what you want. We'll go, we'll go back to normal. Yeah, I'm in my dark little nest now. There we go. Rick. I'm up. Hit me with it. We're going to start out with a calm. I think that this might be the best calm of any rom-com. I think this com, if I could break the scale, I would. This com is a five out of five. I was thinking about giving it a higher than a five too on the scale. Even before I got married and before I had relationships, big rom-com guy. This rom-com movie, I've probably watched it. Love rom-coms, Park. Yeah. Even bad ones, they're the best. Yeah. And this movie is like actually cares about the comedy. It's actually hysterical. Now Park, I'm gonna be honest. Be honest. The ROM doesn't do enough for me to give it a five. I will though, I'll give it a four. And that being said, I, th I know and think there are ROMs that are better. Individual characters I think are absolutely perfect in this movie, but like, but the ROM, I don't know, Park. I just, I'm not, I, I can't give it a five, I'm sorry. I can't do it. Rick, that's okay. So your final score, according to the rom-com scale, is... It's not out and that, and I also, I guess we're about halfway, maybe a little more than halfway, I know we will eventually have our choices. For my choice, I will be choosing my favorite all-time rom-com if we don't cover it previously. And that, that's gonna be the one I think I put this up against the test too, so we're, we'll, we'll see when we get there. To be fair, even with that nine out of 10, that is by and large the highest rated movie of the season so far. Park, I might, like this movie than any movie we watched last season. That's strong. That's strong, I know. And we watched some very good movies last season. I don't season. know if I like this movie more than every movie we watched last season. Eventually, when we're when we're on our hundredth episode park, and we'll get there. We will make a ranking of all the movies that we watched. <laughs> every single movie. <laughs> Tune in for episode one hundred. We're gonna be like on episode three of that season and it's just gonna totally be different. You know those, like, those scratch-off movie posters that people sell about like the 100 essential movies? Or like 100 essential TV shows and you like scratch off or whatever after you watch it? Yeah. We'll make a poster for our 100. There we go, Rick. I'm holding you to it. Just like all of our other outrageous things that we have to hold to. Remember we have that watch, that watch party for Psycho. I think it was Psycho. 40 years later, something like that. It was. We watched party for Psycho. I mean, in the near future, I'm eventually probably going to buy a ridiculous Frappuccino. Or Starbucks order, it might not be a Frappuccino. You might even have to make your margarita and send it off to someone, Rick. I will, hey, 150 bucks, I guess, I guess, we're, I guess we're sellouts. I think this has been a, a successful podcast, don't you? Parker, I had a good time. I, I'm going to be honest, I don't know if it's, it's a conversation, I don't know if it's a couple drinks I had, but it's a great podcast. But before we go, we tell our, our listeners what next week's episode is going to be. Why don't you share with our audience what next week's rom-com is. Park, we are going to watch the movie that the bookstore scene inspired. Hmm. You've got mail. You've got mail. I needed to watch a Tom Hanks movie in the 90s. And Park, I'm getting it. I'm happy. Rick, is it your favorite 90s Tom Hanks movie? Yeah, I think it is. More than Forrest Gump? I think this, I, I think this is still my favorite. Wow. Forrest Gump is the better movie, of course. But like as a personal favorite, I really like You've Got Mail. It's been a few years since I've watched this movie, so I'm excited to give it a rewatch. Park, let's do it. Well, everyone, you've been listening to Two Dudes, One Movie Podcast. The podcast where two dudes dive into cinematic masterpieces from a different decade each week. From black and white classics to modern day blockbusters, 
we'll be covering it all. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week. Shout out to our friend AJ for being one of our podcast faithfuls. We appreciate your support. And uh, if you love our podcast, reach out to us. Maybe we'll shout you out at the end of one of our episodes as well. I'll have what she's having. And good night. Two Dudes, One Movie is an independently created podcast. Like, rate, follow, and subscribe wherever you listen. You can find the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube where we will post full video recordings of each episode. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Two Dudes, One Movie Podcast. Thanks for watching. Thank you.